Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Ayşe Subarkar. Turkey passed a crucial benchmark on May 11, two months after announcing its first confirmed case of COVID-19 and weeks after shutting down non-essential businesses, parts of the economy have slowly reopened, but with strict measures in place. Shopping malls, hair salons and a host of other businesses began letting customers back in. Turkey has followed the path of several countries that started relaxing coronavirus restrictions weeks ago to jumpstart their economies. But in many places, the results have been mixed. Currently, the world is adding around a million new cases every 12 days. And the results from easing restrictions are starting to come in. Many of the countries that partially reopened have seen spikes in coronavirus cases. Now that Turkey is starting to loosen its containment measures, can it avoid new outbreaks from emerging? And is there something it can learn from other countries that may have went back to work a little too early? And to answer that, joining me now from Ankara is Serhat Unal, who is a professor at Hacettepe University's Faculty of Medicine and a member of Turkey's Scientific Committee, a body which advises the Turkish government on its coronavirus response. And joining us from Florence is David Alexander, who is a professor of risk and disaster reduction at University College London. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you here. So Turkey has recently decided to ease lockdown measures amid the pandemic, but we have recently seen South Korea, China, Germany, France, South Africa and Lebanon, which have taken tentative steps to ease their restrictions. Um, reported fresh surges in the number of cases. So, David, what is next moving forward with these countries? Well, I think we face a transition to a new kind of normal. We have to bear in mind that it could take a long time to get over this. The 1918-1920 influenza pandemic, which lasted in the world about 24 months, took five years to get over. That actually led to the Great Depression. So we hope that things are not going to, history is not going to repeat itself this time around. But I don't think there will be any return to pre-COVID life as it was. Mm -hmm. So do you think they have opened up too soon? No, I don't think so. I think providing that the opening up is cautious, we do have to get the economy going. We're going to need Keynesian type stimuli, a sort of Roosevelt type New Deal in many countries. There will be a greater emphasis on welfare. And it's worth bearing in mind what the Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen wrote, that having a good health system, the best that a country can afford, makes very sound economic sense. And yes. perhaps that's something that needs to be kept in mind. All right. Uh, Saha, Turkey has also eased restrictions, uh, allowing yes. malls, malls uh, barber shops, and other uh, small businesses to open. Could you tell us about the phases of Turkey's reopening? How will it work and how it is different than other countries, if even there's a difference? Well, I don't think so. It's different than the others because there are scientifically proven preconditions that must be realized before you go into the second phase, the reopenings. We finished the first phase because we could uh, uh, complete the, we have a good uh, infrastructure for the healthcare. We can take care of all the patients and we can double the numbers when it's necessary. We do very high numbers of the test to, to catch the uh, new cases. And we have the good facilities for the uh, uh, quarantine. Mm -hmm. And the final one, perhaps the most important one, you have to get a tendency reducing of the numbers for the last at least 14 days. Mm -hmm. And Turkey has uh, completed all of that, so we are ready for that. It may be today or tomorrow or one week or two weeks, because it's the, not only the decision of the health, but it's the decision of the uh, political issues as well, because there are other factors influencing the decision uh, beyond the health issue. So at 11th of May, Turkey has decided, uh, as you said, to ease the restrictions. And we still did not see the effect of these uh, easing of restrictions on the number of the uh, uh, new cases, because mm -hmm. the rule says you change something and then you follow the new number, number of the new cases and decide according to that. Mm -hmm. Now the tendency of the, uh, uh, the, the reducing number of the new cases is still in good shape. There are some 
small, uh, I wouldn't say spike, but some the differences in the numbers. It, it's, it's in the limit of the uh, statistic variations, I would say. Mm -hmm. We are following that very carefully, but next week we will follow that more carefully because the main ease of the restrictions started at the 11th of May. So we will see the effect yep. the next week. And, and the government also says for... the government also says the restrictions will be eased further after the public holiday, the Bayram. What happens yes. if there is a surge in the number of cases? Will we be back to uh, the number one, uh, the square number one in terms of the uh, restrictions? Well, of course, again, it must be like that because the, uh, the, our uh, president is explaining uh, in, on the television saying that we are easing a restriction and then we will check the number and we will decide according to these numbers, mm -hmm. either we will, we will get into the uh, new one or we will come back to the uh, older restrictions. So it will depend on the uh, uh, number of the new cases that is followed very carefully every day. And the decision will be decided. It will be held according to this. I mean, oh, okay. I, uh, it's 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 on the table. Okay. So, uh, by the way, two examples stand out when it comes uh, to the surge in cases in Lebanon. After a steady uh, decrease in cases, the government allowed restaurants and cafes to reopen on May the fourth. However, daily cases have been on the rise since. And because of the spike, they have reordered a complete lockdown of the country. South Africa also saw some, something similar. It started easing its lockdown restriction, the strictest on the continent, by the way, on May the 1st, but cases soon spiked. So, David, what can we learn from Lebanon and South African examples? Flexible policy, I think, is the main thing we have to learn. This is something that is very difficult to get under control. It will be got under control, but it takes time. The influenza pandemic of 1918 lasted for 24 months in the world, mm -hmm. and I fear that we're going to have to go on with restrictions of some kind for a long time here if we are to get this under control, in the hope also that some herd immunity builds up as a result of the availability of a vaccine, if one is available, but a vaccine will not be a panacea for this. Uh, it will help, but there will be all sorts of problems associated with utilising the vaccine, distributing it, establishing priorities and so on. Yeah. And, and hence physical distancing will be necessary in some form for a long time to come. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll have to wait at least for a, week, uh, for a year uh, for a vaccine. What should be done in the slightly longer term to mitigate the effects of this disease? Well, we're in a gigantic social and economic experimental laboratory in many cases where we struggle to equate how the modern world functions with what needs to be done to get this under control and back to some kind of normal, a new kind of normal, most certainly. We'll need to reevaluate globalization. Global mobility is and will remain a fact of life, but it does have demonstrable risks, as we've seen. We know that pandemics require concerted international action. Um, uh, one remembers how the previous outbreak of SARS in mm -hmm. 2003 was brought under control by international action, and therefore countries simply retreating into their own borders uh, simply will not solve the problem at the world level. Quarantine, tracing, isolation, physical distancing. I hate to call it social distancing. We want to be close to each other socially. Yeah. We want physical distancing. They have demonstrated their worth. Yeah. And a hands approach to the future will be dangerous epidemiologically, socially and economically. Okay, so Sarah, could the world live yeah. with restrictions forever and accept... Uh, these new changes because the World Health Organization warned that this virus could live with us forever and become endemic. What is your take on that? Well, uh, the, the new stage, second stage, is even harder than the first one. We call it, as you heard before, the new normals. And the uh, uh, Turkish citizens are a little bit reluctant to do that, but we have to remember those things. Mask, face mask, social distancing, and hand hygiene we have to apply that. Those, those new normals will be with us at least at least a year, I would say. But uh, if you look at the uh, other examples like influenza, they, it came and then we learned to live with this virus. So that is a possibility. And we have to see the end of this year and the beginning of the next year. And then we will be able to understand, recommend a little bit more 
how will part, how will behave in the next coming days and mm. and i personally don't believe that it will be like the influenza case i mean if you get a, get a, come out with a good vaccine and there are good advances in this vaccine uh, some companies and some countries are talking about ready of 1 million doses 2 million doses in the in middle of september there are eight so candidate can, vaccines if i'm oh, not yeah, mistaken yeah, right Today, today I have I have heard really good news. Uh, they already started to mass production with the million of doses. Some of the countries and some of the companies, if we can do a good worldwide uh, campaign to vaccinate uh, more than 65 percent of the population, this is the billions. Mm -hmm. I think we can get rid of this uh, new coronavirus out of our uh, daily life. But uh, of course, we may expect it another form in the next 10 years, that is another story. All right, at the moment, President of the European Council, uh, Char Charles Michel, has called on member states uh, to reopen their internal borders as soon as possible, yeah. saying that it is essential for the economy. So David, how to balance economy with social welfare at these times? They are not absolute opposites, which is something. But I do think we need to be rather careful how we reopen the economy. Certain actions um, regarding elements of the economy that are not fundamental to life, uh, for example, certain kinds of shops and so on, uh, can be um, restored and reopened without excessive risks involved, especially small shops where you can perhaps have one person go in at a time and so on, manufacturing where you can distance people within the facility and so on. So I think with caution, this will work and it will start to um, create the revenue that we need in order to um, provide the welfare that we need to provide and so on. And it will start to eat into the recession and, and, um, and rectify things slightly. And then we'll just have to see how it goes. Um, yes, I think vaccines eventually will help, but I'm not totally convinced that vaccines will be completely um, effective in this. And that's something we'll simply have to see by a process of experimentation. I think one of the problems for the economy and everything else about life and the social and the psychological side is that we need to be a little bit more certain about things, but that is very difficult with a disease that has got huge areas of uncertainty, even for those virologists and epidemiologists who are absolutely expert in the field. Okay. And Sarah, lastly, if there is a peak or a second wave, are Turkish hospitals ready not to become overwhelmed? Well, uh, the infrastructure and the response of the healthcare system to the uh, the, the uh, pandemic was the, perhaps the most successful site that we could succeed. Uh, even at the highest number of the cases that we could go, we, we have gone up to 5,400 cases per day. I mean, five, yes, uh, two cases per day. And uh, uh, our system was has gone up to 70% occupation rate mm -hmm. and now the occupation rate of the uh, uh, hospital beds is about 30 percent mm -hmm. and we can easily uh, go up to uh, double the uh, capacity and so i don't think i don't think there's any problem at this point if mm -hmm. we go down the like that going down yeah but and, i think uh, we also I, have to watch carefully the reproduction oh, yeah. rate yeah. which is uh, crucial that's, that's the point yeah all right gentlemen uh, i'm afraid we have to leave it here thank you very much for joining us appreciate it a lot April was a deadly month for the United States in terms of new infections and deaths from the coronavirus. And those grim numbers weren't just limited to people's lives. The health of the world's largest economy is also in critical condition. Food prices rose at their fastest pace in April in more than four decades. One of the largest price spikes hit meat and poultry products. In the same month, the U.S.'s multi-billion dollar meat industry saw an explosion of coronavirus cases at more than 100 plants across the country. Thousands have been infected and dozens have died. Fearing an unsafe work environment, many plants shut down, causing food prices to soar. And it's not just the U.S. Meat processing plants in Germany, Brazil and other beef exporters saw outbreaks infecting hundreds of workers. So far, Turkey hasn't seen any major clusters within its food supply chain. But how long will that last? What precautions has Turkey taken to keep its food supply safe and prices stable? 
And to break that all down, joining me now from Cairo is Abir Itepa, who is a spokesperson at the World Food Program's Regional Bureau for the Middle East. And joining from Konya, we have Sevim Seda Yamach, who is an assistant professor at Konya Food and Agriculture University. Ladies, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you here. So, Abir, how do you think the coronavirus has exposed the fragility of the world's food supply chain? Um, the coronavirus is causing a silent hunger pandemic that is sweeping across the world as we speak. It's basically sowing the seeds of a potential famine uh, in its way. WFP analysis is showing that we probably could have quarter million people, a quarter billion, quarter billion people, 250 million people uh, who could be facing severe hunger by the end of this year because of the consequences of the uh, COVID-19. Many of those people are already in very fragile communities, um, already in conflict areas, in areas facing um, climate change effects. And, you know, this is another blow to them. Um, they are very uh, fragile, so they could not take any further shocks. So it certainly has shown also that the supply chain uh, around the world is quite um, fragile, and we're seeing uh, many places where even access to food is becoming an issue. And, even, and, and this is basically because the world is so interconnected Yes. with high reliance on experts and imports. Yeah. So, uh, Sivim, uh, we're in a troubled region. So how safe is Turkey's food supply chain at the moment? And what kind of measures have so far been taken uh, to ensure price stability, at least? Well, uh, until now, uh, we saw that there is not any, uh, ne there is not so much big problem uh, because uh, uh, actually, I would like to say that the product that agricultural product that we use is from the last year agricultural production. Uh, so now this year, uh, it, we should take care about the agricultural activities uh, to to not uh, face uh, food scarcity uh, for the next year. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, so um, we, we we should really take care. Uh, Agricultural activities, but however, I want to give some examples that uh, for the, for example, for the garlic, uh, most of the garlic we uh, we import uh, we imported from China, but now we stopped the import from the China, so the price uh, almost 50 percent was increased. Yes, uh, this was the yeah, this was the reason uh, you know the Turkish products uh, it, they they increased the Turkish products. So now, next, so we should see this problem uh, to manage the next year. And for other crops, we have so much also. So we they have a storage problem. We already store something, but if we cannot export it, uh, that will be the problem also. You know, the balance is changed yes. already, but yes. uh, we can manage it. Yeah. On the other hand, one country that has seen its food supply hit hard by the coronavirus outbreak is the United States. I want to show some numbers. So there's a map of the meat and processing plants that have seen cases across the US. At 170 uh, plants, there have been more than 5,000 cases of COVID-19, which resulted in the death of 20 people, workers. These people have reportedly transmitted the virus to more than 10,000 others. And yet, as a result, more than 20 meat plants were closed in April. But then the White House statement, uh, released a statement saying President uh, Donald Trump is using the Defense Production Act to ensure the Americans have a reliable supply of products like, like beef, pork and poultry. So, Abir, can you talk on why the U.S.'s meat industry was so hard hit? by the virus and if President Trump's uh, measures have made it worse? Um, this is uh, uh, an area beyond really my expertise. Uh, we are uh, mainly uh, thinking and, and worrying about the fate of the uh, millions and if not uh, the quarter billion people who will be facing severe hunger. Uh, because of the COVID-19. In terms of the food industry, I, I think the impact is huge, and this is why we're seeing it uh, touch and affect, effect, have a major effect on some of the co uh, countries that are uh, net uh, importers. 
-hmm. And this is, you see it mainly in this region, uh, in the Middle East region, where we are seeing around, uh, around 6.7 million people who are at risk of, of severe hunger in these current uh, uh, circumstances and environment. But how will this affect if the supply, affect the supply chain if the uh, uh, workers at, for example, meat plants uh, continue to be infected by the virus? Isn't that a big threat? Of course, there is a big threat uh, at all fronts. But it's um, the, if you look, for example, at the MENA region, We've, as I mentioned, we, at the Middle East region, mm -hmm. we have an additional 6.7 million people who could see, seen, uh, soon be struggling to feed themselves. Okay. Why these 6.7 million? Because, um, because there are little no savings. People are losing jobs, whether it is in the food sector or not. There are increasing food prices. And we already ha have seen reports of increase, increasing food prices because of, of uh, multiple factors, including uh, cases like what you mentioned about, of course, uh, infections in, in plants or even the supply chain itself going weak mm -hmm. because uh, of the closed borders. And because of the extra precautions that you have now to take to get uh, commodities from one country to the other. So there, uh, there is also, uh, with the governments facing huge uh, loss in economy, the social safety net factors are, of course, weakening. And this is exposing the most vulnerable and the poor around the world to these extra cho yeah. shocks. Unfortunately, Middle Eastern countries have always been more vulnerable. So save in Germany, Brazil, and many other countries ha uh, of other meat exporters, let's say, uh, have also been hit. But we haven't heard such reports from uh, Turkey. What has Turkey done differently so far? Uh, as I mentioned, it, uh, first of all, we should know that we are the we have uh, valuable natural sources for agriculture. Uh, so we are the our, our main economy is going on with agriculture. So this was the one reason. And also I want to say that um, our uh, climate and the many other natural things is uh, uh, I mean it's it's useful for agricultural production. So we didn't therefore we didn't face uh, for sure that because and also uh, the pandemic come late to Turkey. It was on March. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, this was the one of the reasons. Now the agricultural production is starting. So we will see next year what will going on. Okay. So Abir, how to keep food supply chains moving under these circumstances? Um, there are two uh, uh, sides to this. The first thing is that we need to make sure that, um, you know, precautions that are being taken not to spread the virus any further beyond uh, borders should be taken into consideration while not disrupting the um, supply chain process. Uh, in addition, we have to focus our efforts or, or on also mobilizing resources to uh, continue to keep in mind the most vulnerable people. WFP uh, Logistics Services at this moment is providing the backbone for global COVID-19 efforts. Uh, mm -hmm. to allow the humanitarian and health workers on the front line of the pandemic to stay and deliver. So we're, we're launching air bridges. Uh, we're, uh, we're, we're opening warehouses around the world, and specifically at this point in three different locations, to allow for the transmission and, the sup and, and to allow for the supply chain for the humanitarian op operations to continue. Perhaps this needs to be looked into consideration for a wider, for the wider economy. I think that um, also with the, with the opening up right now or the easy easing of some of these restrictions, we might see a recovery. Uh, but for sure, the food prices have increased in many places around the world because of this, um, uh, these gap holes in yes. the supply chain process. So how will and uh, should this crisis save him change consumer habits in the food industry? Uh, well, uh, it will change so much. So, the, I mean, we, we should be concentrated uh, to be a self-sufficient country for agriculture. And I mean, for every country. Uh, so this changed uh, many things. You know, the, uh, the, the products that we belong to the, uh, another country, uh, we, should, uh, we should manage in, our, in the countries that, like us, you know, Turkey ha can grow many, uh, we can cultivate many types of crops. 
So now it's time to be self-sufficient. Uh, I want to give an example for Turkey also that um, Turkey now has advantage to be the agricultural market because we are we are connected to three uh, continents: Africa, Asia, and Europe. So you know the supply chain is problem, but we can manage from the Turkey because we are in the middle. We should make a new plan. Yeah, I, I and I also hope that it's a wake up call uh, needed to reform how our food. Uh, gets uh, from farms to our uh, table. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Ladies, thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk. And that's all for this edition of Straight Talk with me, Aisha Subarkash. If you've got any comments, do share them with us on Twitter with the hashtag Straight Talk. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye.